In the kitchen, I laid all my knives in the travel case I kept for them. One or two had some rust spots that required oiling and polishing, and I brought each blade to a new edge on the stone before latching the case shut and slinging it over my shoulder. While engaged in this task, I avoided glancing around the living area or the sun deck or the spiral stairwell, the places where Rin and I had made love. Best to put her out of my mind. As alarmingly real and as tangibly meaningful as it had felt, it was best to put her out of my mind. So crossing the living area, I kept my eyes down on the floor to keep those memory ghosts from chasing me. And it was probably this act, this silliness, that saved my life. You see, some of the panels in the floor were tempered glass, and that allowed a view through to the water that washed under the house, except that the water was gone. I stood for a long time staring. Crabs peeked over the wet sand ripples and knots of weed lay exposed. I looked at my watch. It should have been high tide. Not ten minutes ago, the water had been breaking around the highest part of the beach. I went to the sun deck and spread the heavy glass sliders. Most mornings, I'd taken my prayers on this deck. Rin would unroll her yoga mat here for exercise. You could dive off the front, straight into the lagoon. From this deck, what I should have seen was a vast pool of seawater, as blue as a neon sign. Instead, I saw a plain of glistening white sand, unnaturally silent without the lapping of the waves. It seems foolish now when I think back that I didn't recognise what was going on. I suppose I should have. Perhaps I could have saved someone's life. My papa? My mama? I often wonder, what if I'd made a call right then, at that second? Could I have saved them? That's a sharp and needling pain to live with, let me tell you. As I looked over the empty lagoon, I thought of the stories Papa had told about how the colour of the sea showed its moods, about how the Kunda Ferretta came ashore only from the darkest depths to kill humans, about how you should never cut driftwood because it might bleed. He'd offered no stories of the sea receding in this way, though, so I had no name for it. Before sea level rise had flooded the outermost buildings, the island of Feidu Finlu had formerly been a prison, and after that, a police training camp. Chinese developers had cleared the buildings, rehabilitated the site, and portioned it up for lease. Along the lagoon sat beach homes on raisable stilts. I entered the house and climbed the stairs to the roof and saw people now appearing on balconies or rooftops, just as I was, their hands shading their eyes as they stared across the wet sand flat. We were all staring far out to sea. A wave appeared in the distance. To be honest, I felt relief. It was an ugly wave, bubbling like spilled lemonade, but the sight of it relieved me. Oh, how moronic that seems now. It was like having the pieces of the puzzle in front of me. I had the pieces, yes, and I still couldn't see the entire picture. The water covered the beach and washed over the low sea walls left from the prison days. When it began washing up over the sun deck of the Braden house, Every one of my nerve ends fired at once. I felt the house sway. Water burst through the hollow courtyard and rose and rose until it flooded the lower level. I fell as the building lurched rightward, pushed by the weight of water. At this point, I saw the entire picture. What's it like knowing you're about to die? You hear people say that a life story runs before your eyes, or you grow inhuman strength to free yourself and save others. No, none of this happened. Being on top of a moving house was an event outside the bounds of my imagination. I had no pattern, no pen plate to work from. I felt mindless because my thoughts simply couldn't keep up. As the house tore free of its pylons, I was a crash test dummy. The water spilled from the jacuzzi and broke over the top of me, and I hung onto the rail with every piece of my strength. I held the rail and swung to and fro, probably with a dumb look of serenity on my face. In that instant, the house seemed to roll and crush me. The whole building tilted over. My feet hit the water, which was full of leaves and sticks and plastic. I remember thinking, there goes my sandals, as if that was the worst thing that might happen to me today. The house gave a final epileptic shudder, a groan, and ceased moving. I was left dangling, the waves sloshing around my bare feet, my eyes closed. The sun poured down. I ran with sweat. I shook so hard, my teeth chattered. I remember then speaking the 113th surah that asked for refuge from the evil of the blower of knots and the evil of the envier when he envies. Perhaps I'd regained some sense of danger. 
With effort, I heaved myself up into the empty jacuzzi that now occupied the side of a house like, like a cave in the face of a cliff. From there, I climbed higher, stretching from rail to post to umbrella fixture until I'd reached the summit, what was formerly the north wall and had now become the roof. For many minutes, I couldn't accept what I saw. I walked up and down with my mouth ajar. It was like I'd been plucked and placed on a distant world. Yet, this was Feidu Finlow, or it had been until a few minutes ago. I stood and turned a full circle, surveying the island. There was no island. I was standing in the middle of an ocean. Drip debris drifted about. Only the heads of the coconut palms emerged from the water. Looking north where other houses ought to have sat, there was only a soup of timber, sand, and plant material. I put my hands on my cheeks. About that time, I heard my name being called. Yes, floating on the torn away roof of a house, I saw Muslima, the housemaid for the Dutch people who lived next door. She waved, and I waved back. The roof floated on a debris patch made from the splintered timber and leaves and furniture. She waved and called my name, and I called her name. It might have been any other afternoon where we passed each other on the beach, walking the path to the water taxi berth. The roof turned in the churning water. It jutted. It creaked. Muslima held the satellite dish as her footing became unstable. I called that she ought to swim to me, swim through the churn, maybe use some timber for buoyancy, and that I would pull her onto my roof. But we both looked at the white water running there, full of eddies and currents, and we knew it would be impossible. No one could swim. She called my name and waved, and now there was a note of panic to it. Her roof began to sink, first by corner and edge, and shortly by tipping upright. Muslima climbed and held tight. As the roof fell below the churn, she found other timbers to hold. For a while I could see her hijab darkly outlined against sand and water. She turned in a current and drifted. For a while I could see her as the flotsam pressed about, but then she was gone, and then I didn't see her again. It happened so quietly, so efficiently, that I found I couldn't feel anything other than a sort of confusion. And yet, this was not the worst of it. To the south was Male, the capital, the island city, where my mother lived beside the Friday mosque, where I lived, where I'd always lived. In clear weather, you could make out each apartment tower. Today, it was all dust. The water seemed to smoke. The long, lank shapes of buildings like spectres in the haze. As I watched, freight ships carried on the wave plowed sidewards through the towers on Harvary Ingram and toppled them. Huge buildings, as huge as mountains. Those buildings that housed tens of thousands of people simply toppled and fell. I put my hands on my head. After a while, I dropped to my knees and stared. Here had come the end of all things. Thank you.